Hi, hello, and welcome back to Science as Process and Perspective. So last time, I gave you what I called the standard view of science and knowledge. And I told you that this is sort of a, a loose collection of ideas, vague ideas, often not very explicitly formulated, that occupy the heads of many researchers still today. The standard view is made, uh, founded, grounded on three pillars. One is, is, is positivism, the idea that all our knowledge stems from um, uh, experience that is processed by rational reasoning, um, that we can verify uh, ideas by observation. Falsificationism is the second pillar, um, Popper's view that you can, uh, scientific hypotheses are falsifiable. And Merton's um, sociology of, of, of science, which sort of describes which kind of social norms that you need to get um, certified, trustworthy knowledge for society. It's useful. So this sort of view, which I uh, a bit disparagingly called naive realism, is still very, very sort of um, common today among researchers, but it has a number of problems and we're gonna go into these problems with this lecture. So the first question we're gonna ask here is, is it really sort of possible to have certain knowledge like positivism claims, absolute knowledge? So 100%, we can be 100% sure and uh, can we, we gain knowledge of all the phenomena in the universe, absolute knowledge um, in this kind of sense? And this is sort of an interesting idea. It's not very rational to think this, right? Because we're basically monkeys that barely descended from the trees and we think that we can understand the universe as a whole. That's a bit hubristic, isn't it? It's, it's sort of overestimating ourselves maybe a little bit, I would say. That's one problem. Why would we with our perceptive, cognitive, social, all kinds of other character limitations be able to figure out everything? There's, that's not a very rational thing to think that, that we can do this, right? I mean, I don't think it's very plausible. Another problem is of course, is the universe, if there is a universe, a reality out there, I can assume that for a second. Why does it really, does all of it behave in, in law-like ways? We do know that, that some parts of the universe must um, behave in law-like ways because we can do science. We can recognize regularities, principles, but does, is everything in the universe governed by laws, by, by regularities? Is everything explainable? Who knows? We don't know the answer to this question. So who are we? to claim that we can have absolute knowledge in any, any kind of way. Let us examine this claim and let us start as usual with a bunch of questions that problem, problematize this aspect of, of the standard view of science. So the first question is, should science aim to produce true facts? Think about that. What is a true fact? Hmm. What does it mean for scientific facts to be objective? That's not quite the same as being true. Is the universe governed by universal laws? Can we understand these laws in their entirety in all their glorious detail? Is there a single coherent and complete way to understand the world? So these questions are all related to the stance that I called objectivist realism. The truth is not only out there, but science steadily progresses towards this objective, unique truth. It is an algorithm, a formal activity that accumulates knowledge by directly confronting the natural world. And we get an increasingly accurate picture of how that world works. It's very sort of normal to hold this view. Basically everyone, Every one of us starts out as a common sense realist, as Ron Geary points out in his fabulous little book, Scientific Perspectivism. When you're six years old, you expect to understand the world you live in at some point. You take the world for what it is, 
you don't have these sort of doubts. Is it really real? Does it hold, you know, the possibility for multiple explanations? These are kind of things that only occur to you much later. So we all start out as common sense realists. But what are the kind of problems that come with this stance? Okay, it's worth to really start doubting what can we know for sure. And of course, the most famous attempt at doing this was performed by René Descartes in his meditations, where he took to a radical kind of skepticism. He tried to doubt everything he could possibly doubt. He dismissed all of his sense-based you know, empirical um, knowledge immediately. But he went much further. He imagined this evil demon that would deceive him, that would give him the wrong tools, that his tools of logic were flawed. What was left after this radical process of elimin elimination? The only thing that was left, of course, was Descartes cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. The only thing that was left that he could know for sure was that he existed as a thinker. There are some residual problems with that even. What does he mean by I and I think, therefore I am? But it's really hard to sort of doubt that there is something or somebody thinking when you think. Somebody existed. That's not very useful though. And so Descartes, to explain the entire empirical world, needed to have a, a benevolent God that would ensure the connection between his empirical knowledge and this one certain fact. Okay, so there is one thing we can know, and that is that we exist. But that's, you know, that's very limited. We have to go beyond that. Can we go beyond that? So can we know anything with certainty, really? That's the big question here. So let us sort of rewind a little bit and, and revisit this point that Immanuel Kant first raised about the distinction between analytic and synthetic propositions. So we're gonna sort of back up and retreat into this sort of idea that knowledge is purely propositional. That's not true, but let's just start with that and um, sort of come back to this distinction that the logical positive is elaborated on. So analytic sort of uh, propositions are true or false by definition internal, you know, deductive reasoning can lead you to the conclusion of their truth or falseness. And um, synthetic proposition, on the other hand, are uh, not deducible from definitions directly of the concepts. They can contradict observations, experiments. You can imagine um, the opposites to be true, alternatives to be true. And let's look at a few sort of uh, propositions and, and think whether they're analytic or synthetic. By the way, this argument that I'm going through here is heavily inspired by this wonderful online textbook by Barsegian, Overgaard, and Rupik, which is called Introduction to History and Philosophy of Science. The link is down there. I'll also put it on the website. Um, I heavily recommend you look at this book. It's great. Okay, so what are these sort of statements? Let's have a look. So one plus two equals three, analytic or synthetic? Most people would say it's analytic because its truth value only depends on your definition of one, two, three, and the two operators, addition and um, equality. There is some doubt about that. Kant, for example, qualified this particular statement as a synthetic a priori. You can look that up. I'm not going to go into this. So let's just stick with our classification and say this is an analytic statement. You can deduce its um, truth value basically just from knowing the definition of its terms. All swans are white. This is, of course, a synthetic proposition. You can imagine the opposite. All swans are black. It can be contradicted by observations, experiments. And its truth or falsity cannot be derived from the definition. You know, the definition of a swan doesn't contain anything about being white. So that's a synthetic sort of proposition. Now, what's really important is that not everything that comes in the form of a mathematical formula 
is an analytic proposition. For example, take Newton's law of universal gravitation. Okay, synthetic or analytic? This is a synthetic proposition. We cannot derive from the definition of a force or mass or distance that this must apply, that you know, the, the, the force of gravity depends on the um, square, inverse square distance between two bodies. In fact, you can imagine alternatives. And you know, Einstein's uh, theory of relativity provides an alternative for defining the, the law, um, the, the force of gravity in a completely different way. So clearly, although wrapped in a formula, mathematical formula, this is a synthetic proposition. Okay, so if we, we talk about absolute knowledge, certainty, we need to distinguish between propositional knowledge that is based on analytic and synthetic propositions. Okay, in the realm of the formal sciences, logic, mathematics, theoretical computer science as well, statistics, knowledge consists entirely of analytic propositions. So in these realms, you can have absolute knowledge, absolute certainty within the sort of um, definitions and axioms that you've provided to start with. Come back to that in a second. But in the empirical sciences, that's both uh, natural and social sciences, physics, chemistry, biology, psychology, sociology, economics, you have both analytic and synthetic propositions. And so in this realm, you cannot have any certain knowledge for several reasons that we'll revisit. But let's have a look at analytic propositions first. Can those propositions be absolutely true? So now we're going beyond Descartes' basic insight that your existence is something that you know for certain. And we're gonna say, if you accept the definitions and the axioms of a certain formal system, you can arrive at certain truths within that system. Yes, you can do that. For example, well, you have to stick with your definitions, right? For example, Euclidean geometry, you have a bunch of axioms, among them the axiom that parallels never meet in finite space. And you can derive an entire system of you know, theorems and all that. And they're internally consistent. You can be absolutely sure that they apply if those definitions and axioms apply. But then there are other geometries that you could think of. For example, Riemannian geometry, which breaks this idea of parallels not meeting, right? So in Riemannian geometry, hyperbolic geometry, these, these parallels meet in finite space. But again, within Riemannian, geometry, you can have absolute truth. So both Euclidean geometry and Riemannian geometry are absolutely truth in their own sense, even though they're mutually partially incompatible. That's not a problem. Now, if you think about physical geometry though, Euclidean geometry is associated with classical Newtonian mechanics and Riemannian geometry is the foundation of Einstein's general relativity. Einstein's theory supersedes Newton's theory. So you can say the universe follows Riemannian geometry, not Euclidean geometry. So Riemannian geometry as a physical geometry supersedes Euclidean geometry and it is no longer analytic. So it is no longer absolute. And we are in a synthetic sort of context here. So it's very important to distinguish between pure geometry, which is analytical, versus physical geometry, which is synthetic. But even here in pure geometry, in the pure realm of the formal sciences, you can make an argument that the assumptions, the axiom, where do they come from? And you can make an argument that they ultimately stem from what Quine called a web of beliefs that contain synthetic propositions that are based on experience. So Quine in a very famous paper called um, The Two Dogmas of Empiricism is criticizing this idea. He says analytic propositions, purely analytic propositions do not really exist because 
the definitions that you need for those to be true, they themselves contain some sort of synthetic uh, propos propositional content. That issue is not resolved. So people disagree about this. But basically we can say that yes, possibly you can have absolute truths. You can have proof within formal systems, logic, mathematics, statistics, theoretical computer science. The situation is very different if you move to synthetic proposition and um, the sort of uh, empirical sciences. There it's clear that you cannot have any absolute truth because there are three giant obstacles that prevent absolute certainty. And we're gonna go through them one by one in this lecture. The first one is the problem of sensation. The second one is the problem of induction. And the third one is the problem of theory ness. Let's start with the first, first, the problem of sensation. It is quite obvious that our five senses are limiting what we can perceive. On top of that, our cognitive sort of, you know, limitations limit what part of those sensations we can process and in what way. We are finite beings and that's very important. That's a recurrent theme in this course. So we need to design a philosophy of science for finite beings. Now, the problem is that we can, you know, be fairly sure that our senses, we have evolved, you know, and it's advantageous in evolution to have accurate senses, to have an accurate sort of perception of your environment, your perceived environment. It's very important to survive. So we can say, okay, those senses, they should be pretty good. But that's not what we're trying to do here. We're not trying to establish whether, you know, our senses are reliable generally. We're trying to establish 100% certainty. Can we base anything on that's based on, on experience? Can we establish anything like that with 100% certainty? And of course we can't. We would have to exclude the possibility that our senses deceive us in certain circumstances. And that's completely impossible. So, to summarize this, we receive all our information about empirical objects through our senses. But, so, we, we, so basically we're, we're limited by that. Nothing that you perceive is independent of your perception, obviously. So swans, for example, should not be confused with our sensations of swans. If you look at this picture, that's not a swan. Actually, that's a swan twice removed. If you would look at a swan, the impression you get from the swan would be, well, your mind's impression of the swan. What you're getting here is your mind's impression of a picture of a swan on the screen. Okay, that's not a swan at all. So how can you be sure that this impression in your mind corresponds to the swan, as, as Kant called it, an sich, das Ding an sich. The swan an sich is inaccessible to you. As I said before, our senses may not deceive us normally, but they are not absolutely trustworthy. But there is no way to establish that they are, at least. They could be, but we cannot prove it. There are several ways you could think of getting out of this dilemma. For example, you could say, okay, if I combine sensory inputs, that improves the trustworthiness of my perception. Okay, so for example, I sit in front of, of a wonderful, you know, glass of wine. I can not only see it, I can touch it um, if I hit it with my fingernail, I can hear it, I can smell it, I can taste it. So I'm pretty sure that glass of wine is there, but that does not solve the problem. It just means that your senses together, multimodally could be deceiving you. It doesn't allow you to get past the problem. Nor do technical measurements or tools solve the problem, such as microscope, telescopes, because they only enhance our senses, nothing else. They still depend on the senses. We'll revisit that in a minute. And then this sort of idea that I brought up in the beginning that, you know, we've evolved our senses, they must be accurate because otherwise we would not be around. This is the foundation of evolutionary epistemology. That does not help either, okay, for two reasons. First of all, as an evolutionary biologist, I can tell you that adaptation is, is, is not perfect. It does something that um, Herbert Simon called satisfying. It's just good enough, usually. Furthermore, we could argue that self-deception is, is advantageous for human beings in certain uh, circumstances. Not seeing your limitations is a good thing. 
just look at the celebrities and politicians that we have nowadays. But then, you know, the actual, the most serious problem here is that, of course, um, evolutionary theory itself is built from synthetic propositions. And you cannot get out of this dilemma through a theory that is synthetic itself, okay? It could be wrong. So there is no way out of here, we're stuck. We cannot even tell whether we live in a simulation. Elon Musk, he's fond of telling us that. I don't see the point of believing that we're in a simulation. There are people who really wreck their brains about this. And they say, oh, there would be, you know, the, the computational power would be limited and you should be able to push it and, and see that we're in a simulation. Well, what's the point? I don't see the point, but we cannot exclude the possibility. Philosopher Hilary Putnam, he's a man, despite being called Hillary, he came up with this um, famous Gedanken thought experiment, which is called a brain in a vat. We could be a brain in a vat and all the sense impressions we get could be fed to us through a computer simulation. This of course is the foundation of the movie, The Matrix, which inspired my background here. We cannot tell the difference and we will probably never be able to. So even if we could trust our senses 100%, we'd still have two problems that completely make it impossible to have certain knowledge, empirical knowledge. And the second one of those problems is the problem of induction, first raised by David Hume in the 18th century. So Hume was concerned about the statement, all swans are white. And he said, how do we arrive at, at such a statement? We've only ever seen as finite beings, we've only ever seen a finite sample of swans. So what we're doing is we're taking a limited sample and we're generalizing from that sample and that is called inductive generalization. Inductive reasoning is something that Francis Bacon um, brought in and said it was the foundation of scientific empirical scientific work and reasoning. But the problem with induction is that we're generalizing from a finite sample. And so even if we've seen a lot of white swans, it's always possible that the next swan will be black and indeed, Willem de Flaming in the 17th century traveled to Australia and at the Swan River found a species of swan that is black, Cygnus atratus. Here's a black swan, which proves Hume right. Okay, so this applies to anything else that you're um, inferring through inductive generalization. Because our experience is always limited, our inductive generalizations are always fallible. There are a few exceptions to this. For example, if you look at the complete set of presidents of the United States of America, you have pretty good data on all of them. And you, have, you can be pretty confident that this is an exhaustive set of presidents of the USA. But these, you know, these are special cases. So, one argument that tries to get beyond the problem of induction is based on, on this concept of the uniformity of nature. Inductive generalizations, I mean, they work in practice. Don't get me wrong. Hume is not saying this is not something we should do. He just says it's not a good thing if you are after certain knowledge, okay? And he basically says what, we're, what, what this means is that our, our patterns of thinking, they're sort of habits, okay? So things are associated one after the other and, and we're getting used to that fact, okay? But a habit is not certain knowledge. So to get past this, we could argue that inductive generalizations, they can rely on the assumption that nature is uniform everywhere in the universe, okay? So the same rules apply independent of where you are. And now this principle of the uniformity of nature is supported by ample empirical evidence, okay? A lot of it over the last few hundred years has accumulated and we can be quite certain, but not 100% certain that it applies, that the laws of physics that we know about, they apply pretty much everywhere. Well, sort of, okay, relativity applies in the large domains, quantum mechanics in the small domains. So there's still some limitations, but probably nature is quite uniform everywhere. It doesn't locally, you know, differ greatly. But again, 
this principle of the uniformity of nature is itself based on inductive generalization. Just because we've always found it so far doesn't mean it will always apply and it cannot therefore solve the problem of induction. Okay, so if this is driving you mad, you could say, okay, look, I'm, I'm much more pragmatic than, than this. Habits are good enough for me. I just want to know, I want to have a simple criterion by which I can say, okay, this is a sort of, you know, swans are white, whiteness of swans obviously is something that doesn't generalize because they're black swans. So I want a guide towards identifying um, predicates that are generalizable. So if I can at least distinguish which ones are generalizable and when, which ones are not, then I'm fine. I'm fine with that. But not even that works across the board, okay? And this is something that um, philosopher Nelson Goodman brought up. He called this the new riddle of induction. So he asked the question, if we cannot derive any general infallible laws from inductive inference, can we at least say when generalizations are likely to succeed with which predicates and when not? So for example, he said, you know, emeralds. Emeralds, as far as we know, they're all, always green. Okay, so here's a green emerald. Bluebirds, on the other hand, they're always blue. That's why they're called bluebirds. So we should be fairly confident that green emeralds and blue bluebirds are generalizable predicates. He calls these projectable predicates. But then he says, no, 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 no. I can make up some arbitrary predicates that also apply. And those are the colors Gru and Bleen. Basically, Gru is being green right now, but at some arbitrary point of time, indicated by the T here, in the future, all emeralds will turn blue. So they are really Gru, not green. The same for bluebirds. All these bluebirds, at some point in time, they may turn green. We cannot exclude this. So they're really bleen, not blue. But of course, glu and bleen are completely arbitrary, made up conventions. The point is here that Nelson Goodman said, says that there is no sort of principled way in which to distinguish projectable and non-projectable predicates. Okay, so if we start from first principles, we're screwed. If we want to generalize, we can never be certain that we can. Okay, we need to be very careful when using inductive generalizations. Again, neither Goodman nor Hume are saying we shouldn't use inductive generalizations or that scientific knowledge or any knowledge is impossible. They do not say that. They only say certainty is impossible in these cases. Okay, but that is not all. So there's a third problem, as I mentioned before, and that's the problem of theory ladenness. What you see here is an amazing picture of the Hubble Space Telescope of what are called the pillars of creation. The beautiful uh, nebulae, parts of a bigger nebula. This is an infrared picture. So you can see stars being born and different chemical compositions of the clouds in this picture. It's a huge composite image of many, many images together. Now think about everything that went into this and what you need. If you look at this, it has high recognition. So people recognize it because they've seen it before and they know what it is. So just think about what it takes for you to recognize it as what it is. And also think about all the technologies that went into building this picture. This is not what you would ever see with your eyes because it's, it's made in the infrared spe spectrum. So you could never see this with your naked eye. Does it really exist? What, you know, what is the status? So, so what are the kind of theoretical assumptions that go into um, making this picture meaningful? So this, this problem of theory ladenness was first pointed out by Willard Van Orman Quine and uh, then elaborated on um, by Thomas Kuhn. And so these guys say that our observations interpretations are heavily laden with assumptions. So even if we just look out the window and see that it's raining, we have a lot of assumptions that go right in there. So, you know, we, we have a sort of a intuitive grasp of optics. We assume that the light that's coming in is not just some reflection or illusion and so on and so forth. I mean, we can construct all kinds of contrived cases where you could see rain and it's not really rain. The basic point is that, that our observations, perceptions, interpretations are always heavily laden with assumptions. 
Remember Neurath's boat. We have to rebuild the boat as we go along. And this, by the way, is where Quine also says that our definitions that go into the analytic statements are problematic. Okay, so I've, I've talked about this before. Our assumptions depend on previous knowledge, always. The theories we already have about the world. These theories change over time, and so do our observations and interpretations. And so there can be no pure statements of facts like the Vienna Circle guys claimed there could be these sort of observational um, uh, statements to verify knowledge, completely impossible. Thomas Kuhn elaborated on this and sort of pointed out um, finer aspects of this. For example, something he calls salience. That if you imagine two physicists investigating a pendulum, one of them is an Aristotelian, the other one is a Newtonian. The Aristotelian, she would think that the, the rock, you know, at the bottom of the pendulum, is sort of attracted, it tries to go where it belongs, right? To the bottom. So she would measure the weight of the rock. She would measure the distance between the rock and the ground because that matters in Aristotelian physics. And she would also measure the time it would, you know, um, take the rock to get to its resting position. While these sort of, these things make no sense to the Newtonian, the Newtonian would, well, she would also measure the rock. But then she would measure the displacement of the rock from its resting position and the time it takes for one swing. Because the swinging of the pendulum in that sort of theory is interpreted as driven by the, the, the law of gravity, the force of gravity, not sort of a desire to be at a resting place. So these are completely incompatible, or as Kuhn called them, incommensurable sort of views. And if you, if you come into this problem with such different theoretical um, assumptions, different features of the system will be salient to you. Okay, there are other problems here that he distinguishes. For example, perceptual or semantic loading of the problem. I'm not gonna go into this, but so th there's a lot of fine grained theory on, on how theories go into your perceptions, but there, there are also um, quite some, some other sort of tricks that your mind, you know, your brain plays on you. One is the filling in the gaps, okay? So if, if the brain cannot make sense of a situation like this image called concave and convex by MC Escher, then it just makes up stuff. It's amazing to look at this image. At the, on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, the two halves are, have different perspectives and they go into each other in the middle where they're completely incongruent. You can never, just like a, a Necker cube or, or any other optical illusion, you cannot see both ways at the same time. So your brain has to switch back and forth to create a three-dimensional perspective from this two-dimensional image. And of course, there is nothing like that. What you have here is a two-dimensional lithograph. Quite simply, there is no three-dimensional structure. Your brain is making that up as it goes along, which is a real problem if you think about unbiased um, sort of perceptions. It gets worse when you involve technology, of course, and, and we've briefly mentioned this, the problem of sensation. So think about measuring temperature with a traditional mercury or alcohol sort of uh, thermometer. All right, so you have uh, a sensor, which is the liquid expanding. You have some sort of converter, which is the scale around the capillary tube. And then you have your senses that need to read the readout that could deceive you. So basically, any sort of technology is just an extension of your senses. But these extensions are often based on a lot of theory. Here, the expansion of liquids, different liquids um, with temperature, for example. Or much worse, think about super resolution microscopy. So our ability to see things is limited by the wavelength of the light that they reflect. This is called the diffraction limit in optics. And people have devised several methods of which I show only one here in this technical diagram to get beyond that diffraction limit. Basically, what do you do? Is what you see here is, is a microscope, the schematic uh, on top and the left lower corner. You see what would happen if you would excite a certain structure that's very small beyond the diffraction limit. You would get this blurry sort of dot. Through different tricks, 
in this case of this microscope called a STED microscope, you have two phased lasers that sort of deplete each other. You can reconstruct what looks like the real structure beyond the diffraction limit. So this is a structure that is too small to see, but because you know a lot about the physics of the object that you're imaging and the electrons that are being reflected from it, you can actually come up with a picture that has a better resolution that is physically possible. This is quite amazing. It works. But what do you make of this? There are also software solutions for this, not based on hardware, deconvolution algorithms. They give you better data than you could possibly get from the physical setup of your microscope. Do we trust this sort of knowledge? Is it real, what we're observing? These are tricky questions. OK, so what we arrive at is a slightly revised view of science here that's no longer a standard view of science, OK? So the truth, well, it may be out there, OK? But we can't be certain, OK? This doesn't mean that we have to sort of drift you know, or descend into to postmodern relativism and say, oh, all forms of knowledge are the same. They're not. Some forms of knowledge are more dependable, more trustable than others, more certain than others, but it's a matter of degree. We can never be absolutely certain. We will never have certain knowledge of the reality that is out there. And this very, very important doctrine is called fallibilism. Of course, Popper's um, view of falsificationism is one sort of form of fallibilism. Its opposite is called infallibilism or foundationalism. These sort of views that, that say that we can know everything there is to know about the universe. And they still exist, for example, among theoretical physicists who are trying to find a theory, the famous theory of everyone, everything. Steven Weinberg, for example, Nobel Prize winning physicist is one of these people. But, you know, the fact of the matter is no synthetic proposition is infallible. Empirical knowledge can never be absolutely certain. Of course, we cannot be certain of that either. <laughs> but science, and that is the end point of this lecture and the take home message here. The point is that science is, has never been and will never be about certainty. If you want certainty, go to church. Revealed faith, there, you have it, you're convinced. Scientific knowledge is always open to revision and always has to be. Otherwise, it's not scientific knowledge. And this is a very important point to take home. It is not the point of science to provide true facts. The situation is much more complicated than that. And that means objectivist realism. It's just not a thing we can achieve as finite human beings. Over the next two lectures, we'll go and dive way deeper into this question. What is an appropriate philosophy of science for limited beings? And we'll introduce a sort of new kind of realism, a realism with perspective. I hope you join me again for those lectures and you've enjoyed this one. See you soon, next time, goodbye.